I'm going to show a little video on this side. You guys may need to get up for one second and see it over here because it doesn't, the screens aren't connected. So, um, and then I'll explain it in, as soon as we finish. It's two minutes and nine seconds, so it won't be a long stand up, I promise. Um, and now that I know the group, it's a little embarrassing, but I'll show it anyway. So, go ahead. I'm Joe Harburg, and ever since I was a kid, I've had one passion eating chocolate. I've been all over the world meeting chocolatiers and finding great places to eat chocolate. We're at the Fudge House in San Francisco. I'm at the Toysha Shop on the Strip in Las Vegas. I'm in London for Chocolate Unwrapped. I'm at the Hot Chocolate Run in Chicago. Chocolate. Uh, you're the chocolate guy. Do you like chocolate? Everybody loves chocolate. Once you try one, you just keep eating more and more and more. Help! Does that work? That'll work. So people often ask me what my favorite chocolate is, and of course everyone knows I like all chocolate. I'd like a frozen hot chocolate, double chocolate cake, and just to be safe, let's have a milkshake on top of it. What am I missing? Chocolate fudge. Chocolate over chocolate brownie. A habanero infused chocolate. Never imagine mixing chocolate and ranch, right? You can mix chocolate with everything. Caramel, toffee, Caramel. with bacon. I'm eating pasta infused with chocolate, chocolate beer. Chocolate pizza for the entree. Oh yeah, save room for dessert. Basically, if it's about chocolate, I love it. I'm standing in front of the coolest chocolate clock in the world. We're at Max Brenner's International Sensation Chocolate Store. This place is Mecca and I love it. It's where I go for all of my gifts for holidays. Chocolate in 3D? Chocolate will never run out of ideas. Companies make new chocolate every single year. She's Willy Wonka and we're going into the factory. I'd like to take a bath in that. I never dreamed that I would climb over the moon in ecstasy, but nevertheless it's there that I'm it's done. Eat more chocolate! It's better than good. It's delicious. It makes me want to cry, but I want you to take this journey with me. Let's go. Hey, come on. And with a golden ticket, it's a golden I thought this was the National Confectioners Association. Really, I, I didn't think this was venture capital, but I'll tell you a story about that. Um, I do love chocolate, and I wear it well, I'm told. Milk, chocolate, and, milk and chocolate, and, uh, dark and white chocolate all over the place. Um, chocolate, as Forrest Gump said, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what's inside till you bite into it. If I thought I was going to be standing here uh, even a year ago or 20 years ago, I would have never guessed it. Um, paths in the road are really strange, and you never know where you're going to go. And I think I'll, I'm going to give you a little history of me in addition to chocolate, if you don't mind, it's going to be hard to read, so I'm going to kind of run through it pretty quickly. But I think it'll give you an idea of, of why I think this is the perfect time um, to be in the space that we're in. And I think all of you will eventually get into what we're doing in one way or another if you're not already doing it. Uh, I started as a lawyer, as Mahesh said. And, and by the way, thank you to everyone at Encore for letting me come speak today. Um, I'm not a, a presentation deliverer by... by uh, um, education or certainly by experience but uh, so ask questions or stop me if I'm going off on a tangent somewhere um, this is really meant to kind of be a, a flow of how we got here and where I think the world is going in terms of uh, of crowdfunding crowdsourcing and we'll define all that in a minute um, and and how people are going to be attracting and getting investors to their deals over time um, it, uh, it started, I was a lawyer uh, by education. Um, I have an older brother that's a lawyer. He said, if you're going to call yourself a lawyer, you've got to practice for a year. So I served my sentence in his law firm. I realized after that year that he only wanted cheap labor. So I, after that year of, of serving my sentence, I was lucky enough to sign on with a group called the Sharper Image. Those of you older than 50 probably remember the catalog and, and the stores. Uh, if you're under, it was a gift and gadget concept that was really cool back in the 80s. And Richard Tallheimer was a lawyer that had practiced for one year, and his law firm had told him that, uh, and it, during that year, he was selling products in magazines, and they came to him and said, you can either be a lawyer or you can be a retailer, but you can't do both in our law firm. And so he quit and ran off and became a cataloger and started a very cool concept of finding the newest gadgets in the world. And he, he, we met, and um, there were a whole bunch of, of weird circumstances. He asked me to come be his assistant, and kind of learn the business. We had family friends in Europe that were retailers, and I 
had this dream of becoming a retailer in Europe um, and taking the sharper image there and, and he really gave me the opportunity to do that if he liked me and we worked well together. Uh, as things happen, you know, again, these whys in the road, I was there when he decided to go public and decided to start retail. And um, so he made me the in-house lawyer on the public offering, ever, having never done that before, obviously. So I was the, a gopher on one of the hottest IPOs in the world from the inside position. And then uh, while I was in New York, from San Francisco, we were in San Francisco, going back and forth for the road shows and all the things that were going on, he said, hey, why don't you find me a location on Fifth Avenue because if I'm going to go public with all this great money, i got to at least have a store in Manhattan or they won't believe I'm a real retailer. So I started looking for retail uh, locations. Again, never done it before in my life, hottest retailer in the world, and he's sitting here telling me, go find a location in Manhattan, which is the, most, which is the riskiest place in the world. And I looked at him and I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. Why would you have me look for it? And he said two things. First of all, pardon my French, any dumbass can find a location, and I'm the one who's going to make the decision in the end, so it doesn't really matter if you find a, a bad location. I'm not going to do it if I don't like it anyway. And then he handed me a clicker. And I looked at the clicker and I said, what's this for? And he said, well, we sell to people with ties. So during your breaks from the IPO work, I want you to go stand on every intersection on Fifth Avenue and count ties. And when we get to the one that has the most ties, that's probably where you're going to find a good location for us to put a store. So for two weeks, and those in the real estate business can appreciate this, for two weeks I went every minute that I didn't have time doing something you know, on the IPO, I was on every intersection from Saks Fifth Avenue all the way up to 60th Street. Um, and I, I was standing in front of the, uh, I was standing on the corner of 57th Street and Fifth Avenue where Tiffany's is and Trump Tower. And I uh, was sitting there counting ties and the, and the guy comes out of the building and goes, what are you doing? I've seen you on every intersection for two weeks. And I said, well, I'm counting ties. And we started this conversation and I, he said, uh, what are you doing it for? And I said, well, very confidential. I'm looking for a retail location. And he said, this is my building. I'm the real estate broker on this building. If you want a location here, I can give you the best deal you'll find in Manhattan, but we have to do the deal in two weeks. Now, those of you doing real estate understand that that is incredibly fast for a deal anywhere in the world. Manhattan is even more difficult and I said, I, literally, there was a space almost on the corner. It was more on 57th Street than 5th Avenue, if you know New York. So a little bit off the main path. But at the time, real estate, now it's going for about $500 a square foot. At the time, rental rates were about, a, about 200 And that was a really, before the 87 bus, this was 86, early 87. And he said, uh, uh, rents were probably about 200 a foot. And he said, I can give it to you for $75 a foot if you take that 4,000 feet right there and, pay, and sign the lease in two weeks. And I, I said, I guess so. Well, I think my boss will come look at it because it seems reasonable. And I said to him, why? And he said, well, I'll give you a, the exact reason why. This building is owned by the New York Land Company. Anybody know the New York Land Company? Anybody remember the New York Land Company by any chance? He said, New York Land Company is owned by a guy named Ferdinand Marcos. And Ferdinand Marcos just got kicked out of the Philippines, and the U.S. government's going to freeze all of his assets in two weeks. So if I can get a deal done in the next two weeks, I get my commission. If I don't, I don't get a commission. So I don't care what you rent the thing for. i got to rent the space now. So Richard jumped on his jet. He flew out. We shook hands on the deal. We signed the deal 10 days later, and that was my first real estate transaction. It was in Manhattan. So there's a real estate tie into this mash at some point. Uh, but again, it's this opportunity. You never know where you're going to be there, and you just have to be, take advantage of the opportunity when it's there. Uh, we came back to San Francisco. We had a tremendous public offering. It was great. This was pre-internet. So we had gone out at uh, $10 a share. Um, the stock immediately jumped to $12 a share, and people thought we had, Richard said he would never talk to Goldman Sachs, or talk to Dean Witter and um, Goldman Sachs because they priced it way too low, and all the value that should have been in his pocket went to the investors and was furious. Interesting lesson in that. And uh, while we're in our first executive meeting after the, uh, the IPO, the real estate manager stood up and in very not nice terms said to Richard, you're the biggest mm -hmm, I've ever met in my life, and I have no interest in working for you anymore, but I do appreciate you giving me my retirement fund. I'm out of here. I'll be in my office if you want me to stay, otherwise I can leave you know, for two weeks, otherwise I can leave. 
So he jumped up. Everybody was like, whoa, that was kind of weird. I mean, 30 seconds into our first meeting. Um, and he, uh, Richard looked around the room and he said, well, I never really liked that guy anyway. Joe, you're the head of real estate. Never done a real estate deal in my life other than Manhattan. So I guess I was on top of the world. And I became the head of real estate for Sharper Image within you know, three weeks of even knowing I was in the real estate business. So um, again, right place, right time. Never know when you're going to be there, but take advantage of it when you get there. We, uh, we did 70 stores in one year period. Uh, the stock market crashed in 1987, um, about six months after we went public. Uh, I was from Texas, grew up in Houston, went to the University of Texas, went to law school here, uh, went, decided I wanted to move back to Texas. I knew we weren't going to do new stores, so hanging on to Sharper Image was not going to be a great thing for me. Moved to Texas and uh, started a real estate consulting firm with Sharper Image as my first client. I wasn't dumb. I needed the, the name, even though we weren't doing new stores. And then because of the down market in 1987, every retailer was firing all their real estate departments because they weren't going to do new stores. So I just casually went into all the people I had met when I was doing Sharper Image deals and asked if I could represent them, knowing I wouldn't get any, many deals out of it, but I could at least put the names on the wall, and ultimately built a very strong retail and restaurant consulting practice representing Sharper Image, Polo, Eddie Bauer, Sunglass Hut, uh, Laura Ashley, Scandia Down, uh, Cheesecake Factory, uh, all of which were on the down for six months or a year and then turned around and came back. And when they came back, I was already under contract with them. So it became easy for me to grow my business and tell them I could scale up and down. They could just offshoot it to me. Did that for about uh, two, three years. Realized very quickly that a lot of the early stage companies that were coming to me were looking for money. They were looking for me to put a strategic plan together to put into their um, uh, business plan to go out and raise money. Kind of everybody here raises money. Uh, and 75% of the time, they'd raise their money and would not come back to me to implement the plan, which frustrated me quite a bit because they wouldn't pay me for the plan because they couldn't afford it. But they promised when they got their money, they would use me. Didn't happen. So, um, and I'll give you some examples. Anybody remember P in the Pod, the maternity store? I did the entire U.S. strategic plan for them. They went out and raised their money from a group called Philip Smith here in town. And then Philip Smith had a brother-in-law in real estate, did all their real estate work, and off it went. I did the originals. I, I was flown to uh, Phoenix to look at a concept to do the U.S. plan for them. Um, we didn't do a lot of street, at that time called category killer stores. We did mostly mall and lifestyle uh, tenants. And uh, guys flew us out there and we walked through this warehouse and it smelled terrible. I mean, awful. And as we're walking out, I said to my partner, I, um, I really don't think this is going to work because we buy Gaines burgers at the grocery store. This thing called PetSmart will never make it. So you don't always get it right. But we did do their first national strategic plan for where PetSmart could go. And then they did not use us to do the, the ultimate implementation. So we started, we said to each other, we should put an investment group together, investment group together, to take advantage of the companies that were coming together. My partner came from real estate, wanted to put money into the real estate. I came from retail, so we wanted, we, I wanted to invest in the retailers, and I kind of went out in the beginning. And so we started looking for concepts to make investments in. And first concept I found was a little two-store chain in Northern California uh, called Restoration Hardware. I don't know if you guys have seen the stores here. They're getting bigger and stronger. But we were the first venture group in Restoration Hardware, and from that grew to a pretty sizable investment fund, uh, ultimately raised money and became a fund, and did investments in, in 28 or 9 retail and restaurant concepts. So that was tremendous. Did that through the early 20s, early 2000s, sorry. Um, and then uh, got a call in, in 2000 from uh, Steve Jobs and Ron Johnson at Apple, and I did the original strategic plan for Apple, did the first 100 stores myself. World is always round. Um, we had a location in Manhattan that we were going to do that was five stories tall on Fifth Avenue that I'd found that um, we worked on an awful lot. It was five stories, 5,000 feet each one, $20 million a year in rent. $20 million a year in rent. Um, everybody had to sign their name on the LOI before it went to jobs to, to ultimately approve all deals, but especially that one. And it came, it circled back to me to sign the deal. And I looked at it and I said, I can't in good conscience have a client pay $20 million in rent. Um, I got to look and see if there's one more option out there. So I went back 
to Fifth Avenue, my old stomping grounds, and I walked up and down the street, and I thought, I'm hungry right now. I got to get something to eat. And I remembered that there was a sub-ground space underground in front of FAO Schwartz that I'd eaten at when I was working the street in 1987. And I walked back over, and it was boarded up. And I said, wow, that was a big restaurant, and that's a big front-end board that you walk down to. So I called the broker we were using, Robert Futterman, and I asked him if he knew who owned the building, and he said, yeah, the guy who's trying to rent you Soho. And we didn't do his deal in Soho, but this guy had built a building in Soho for Apple that we didn't end up taking. Um, that's going to build it and they will come. Didn't happen then. <laughs> and uh, we called him 25,000 feet, contiguous space, one level underneath. My wife and I just got back from Paris, so the Louvre was kind of in my mind of going down into the opening. And I called Ron Johnson, who ran retail at the time, and I said, I think I found a better location, but it's underground. Um, they said, he said, you know, take a picture and um, send it to him, fax it to me, you know, kind of thing. Didn't do that much emailing of pictures back then. And uh, so I did, and Steve and Ron flew out. We got the deal for $75 a square foot because it was basement space. Who rents basement space? Of course, I didn't tell them it was for Apple until um, after we were pretty much done. But it was uh, 75 bucks a foot, so the rent um, is about a million four a year. That ended my career with my partners because the commission is a little bit less on a million four versus 20 million. No, I'm teasing that didn't quite work that way. Um, but it, was, it, it is the Apple store on Fifth Avenue which is uh, at 20 million would have been a good deal because that store does, last year did almost $500 million in volume. So if you think about retail and, and location, 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 that's the deal. So anyway, left that, started a venture, sold the real estate business because I figured I couldn't get any better, any better location, any better client, couldn't do a better deal, couldn't do, I was tired of traveling 200 days a year. Um, they asked me to go to China and map out China for Apple, which I knew would end up in, a not good thing for my family. And so sold the real estate business to my partners and started a new company called Current Energy, uh, which is a retail, was a retail concept and really a building automation system that I did with the Perot family. Um, we bought a company in Russia, building automation system, brought it here and made small office buildings and really great in restaurants, very, very efficient, taking control and monitoring gas, water, electricity and raised 50 million in venture capital money into that concept, uh, bought the company, moved it here, went from zero to 300 people in about 18 months. Um, very interesting, fast paced deal. And then of course, 2008 comes around and nobody invests in real estate anymore. So we sold it to a Finnish company and I started on my quest for, my full-time quest for chocolate, uh, looking for the best chocolate in the world. And then a funny thing happened, I'm sitting here trying to match up chocolate eaters and chocolate makers, making no money, still have never made one dime, never had any revenue on the chocolate thing. It's purely a passion site. But um, Ed Butowski, who co-founded the business with me, is a wealth manager here in town that a lot of you may know, uh, came into my office. I subleased space from him, was in his office. Ed came in uh, about two years ago and he said, my life is about to change. And I said, oh, that's great, because for me, change is always pretty good. And he said, no, you don't understand. My life is about to end. And I said, what? He said, the Jobs Act. And I said, never heard of it before. It sounds good to me. Jobs for people is pretty good. He said, no, nothing to do with jobs. It's now anyone can send any deal to anybody and everyone can look at it. And when you look at it, it's, it's going to be, uh, I don't know what slide this is. What you're, when, you're, when, you, when deals come to, your, to my desk, every, come to my clients, every single one of them is going to send them to me to read and tell them whether or not it's a good deal or a bad deal. And so my life of never having to look at private equity deals is, is over. I've got to look at every one of them and evaluate them and tell my clients if they're good deals to invest in. And there's got to be a better way than just receiving stuff over emails or taking hour meetings with people that I really don't want to meet with. And so I went home and I woke up at two in the morning and I thought, wait a minute, I'm matching chocolate eaters with chocolate makers. What's the difference between matching investors with investments? It's virtually the same thing. Um, obviously a lot grander scale and a lot more detail. Very naive at the time in terms of how this actually works. But it's, um, it's very simple and I'm a huge Kickstarter fan. Everybody know Kickstarter? Who knows Kickstarter? Everybody familiar with Kickstarter? So for those that don't, Kickstarter is a fantastic website. And 
Um, it, it basically is a donation-based way of people raising money. You don't get equity. You, you, you have no ownership or debt or anything on a business. If you see, it's primarily for products or movies. It, the movie guys love it because what they basically do is if you give $100, you're, then we send you a T-shirt with the name of the movie on it. If you give $1,000, you're an assistant producer. If you send $5,000, you're an associate producer. If you spend $10,000, you're an executive producer of the movie. And who doesn't want to be an executive producer of a movie you believe in? So they raise a lot of money for movies through, through this platform. Product companies use it. Um, I, I, bought, I bought a very cool, I should have brought it. Um, there's a container that I use in the kitchen for Oreos. And, of course, and I, um, it's got a lock, a, a, a digital lock on the container. So you put the day and the time that it's allowed to open, and then it, you can then open it up and pull out the Oreos, and if not, you gotta wait till the thing self-destructs or lets you open it. And Kickstarter was perfect for that, because if you gave $100, you got a product when they finally made it available for, for, uh, for, for ready for release. So lots of product companies, instead of trying to go out and raise venture capital, are able to use Kickstarter to prove the concept. And, you know, it costs them $15 to make it. So $15 goes toward the, the actual product, $85 they have for R&D and, and their in-house uh, money needs. And so everyone's happy to spend $100 on the, be the first one to have it on their block, even though it would only retail for maybe $30, $25. But it's, it's, it's these things, that Kickstarter, if you haven't been to Kickstarter, you have to go to Kickstarter. So that's, um, that's and I'm going to jump, do this slide first and then come back to it. Um, you can't read it, too small. All right, donation crowdfunding, I'm on slide three, yeah, uh, that's it. So there are three types of crowdfunding. Um, the definitions of crowdfunding are terrible out there. They mix everything. So I'm going to tell you Joe's definition of crowdfunding. Donation-based crowdfunding is just like Kickstarter. You don't get any equity, you don't get any debt, you don't get anything um, of value other than either your name on the wall or a product, or you're helping somebody with a cause you really enjoy. Then there's crowdfunding investing. And effectively what that is, is that you're, you see something on a site that you like, and you put money into the site, and the site makes the investment. So you're, you're part of the crowd that makes the investment. Very nice for, it's generally defined, and this is pretty much a definition of the SEC, under a million dollars, if you're raising less than a million dollars, there's a, and I think on this thing here, and I can certainly send it to people um, if you don't have it, but it's, it's, um, it's capped at uh, 500, I believe, depending on what it is, 50 to 500, but 500 investors. Um, and it's a very cool way to sell equity but to a fund, one partner, when you're a, 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 an entrepreneur, one partner, because the money's pooled at the crowd level, the crowd makes the investment. Then, then there's what we call crowdsourcing investing, and that's what we do, which is basically, we're trying to bring a crowd in, but then individuals make the investment. And those are generally the higher deals, two to $20 million deals. Um, if they're being done on the, on, the, on the web, which is where we fall, that's the area, and we could go down lower than that, but effectively, it fills the, the gap between angel investing and where VCs would pretty much pick up. There's a, there's a gap there. The old SBICs, if anybody knows what SBICs are, um, Small Business Investment Company, which is licensed by the, by the uh, SBA, <clears throat> they used to fill that gap, and they do fill that gap, but they're really pretty much all debt now, back to being debt uh, deals. And so, um, in terms of equity, uh, crowdsource investing, I think, is where it's going. Now, let me start back a little bit and explain fundraising. Again, for those of you that don't, aren't familiar with this on a regular basis, you certainly always start with yourself, your credit cards, your friends and your family. You work your way up the tree to someone that's an angel investor. Generally, angels and investors know something about the space that you're in so they can add a bunch of value, at least you would hope if you're going out and finding an angel, it's not just for the cash, it's to lend some expertise into the company and help you kind of guide you along the way as a mentor. That those have always been the best angel investors that I've found. Then you jump up to venture capital. There's, there's probably a little bit of gap between the two, but this is a good slide. 
then private equity does the buyouts and they're the bigger firms and then ultimately you're you're bought or you go public and that's kind of the general rule of stuff the the world kind of went on its end several years ago with the internet 1933 we're coming out of the great depression and the fastest easiest way for the government when they created the SEC and the Securities Exchange Act of 33 was say private companies are private, public companies are public, and never the two shall meet. And so if you're public, all kinds of rules around disclosures, when insiders can trade, all that wonderful stuff. If you're private, we don't want you dealing with people you don't know, because ultimately you won't mess around with people that you know, theoretically. So the rules are, if we cut the line straight down the line, no public, um, no ability for, for you to go out to the public and raise money, less chance of a scam or, or, or some problem happening down the road. That law was in existence for 80 years until, 19, until 2013 when the Jobs Act came around. <clears throat> the Jobs Act opened up because of social media. There hadn't been social media, I personally don't believe there ever would have been changed, a change to the law. But when you have people that make in, small investments in small companies, Ashton Kutcher in Uber, and he tweets out, hey, I just made this investment in this really cool company. You should try it, and you should maybe invest if you can. Boom, it's a, a million-dollar fine. You're publicly soliciting for an investment. And I think that over time, the SEC thought it out correctly. They're going to be in really big trouble. You can't fine everybody. You can't stop people from exercising their First Amendment right to say, I just did something or I'm going to do something. So they were really heading for a battle, I believe, um, between governmental law and the Constitution, which basically said, you know, somebody's, I find it hard to believe somebody can stand up and say um, it, is this, it is equivalent, saying you should invest in this company is equivalent to saying there's a fire in a theater. I mean, it just doesn't equate on the same level. So you can't stop the flow and you can't uh, pick somebody out to go prosecute them. So they had to change the law. And I think ultimately it's going to be a great thing for all of us if we keep track and make sure that people are doing it in an honest way. Now, they opened it up a little bit in the late 90s. And if anybody's seen the movie, what's the movie with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio that came out last year? Thank you. If you've seen that movie, then you will recognize that basically that was the beginning of public solicitation for public companies, but those public companies were anything but public companies, and it just blew the doors off, and it scared the SEC to death. So a lot of what's going on now in terms of opening up and allowing people to go out and market private companies is with that lens over the SEC. They're very nervous about people smiling and dialing and, and pushing stocks up. Fortunately, private companies don't have the ability to push and shove at the same time. You're in it for the long haul, presumably. But it's still very subject to people scamming the public, which no one wants to see happen. So on, on a uh, go-forward basis, people can generally solicit. There are a few hurdles. It's called the 506C program. 506B is the original program that everybody still, for the most part, 95% of people are still doing the B program where they're not doing general solicitation. But those that are stepping out, and I think stepping toward the future, like Encore as an example, those of you at Encore, raise your hand, um, are really going to take advantage of where the world is going. And, the, and I think the people that do it early will be the ones that profit the most from that, that opportunity. Basically, you, you no longer use a subscription agreement um, that, the, that the investor self verifies they're an accredited, accredited investor. The, if you do a 506C program deal where you're doing general solicitation, you have to physically verify that the company is an accredited, that the investor is an accredited investor. You have to get a copy of their tax return, a copy of their financial statement, or have, it certi have a letter sent in certified, quote unquote, by an accountant, a lawyer, a financial planner, saying that the person is accredited, which is how everybody's doing it. Um, it's... Uh, it opens the, that's the major hurdle that people think about. Now, Encore will tell you there are lots of other hurdles because it does take a little bit of time. SEC's backed up. But 
the hurdles are not overwhelming in the, in the grand scheme of things. And once you get it, you, you really have opened up the world to what, to what you're looking for. Uh, there's a sheet on the left of the screen. I passed it out because there's no way to read it on the screen. It's a, just an interesting um, sheet that if you can read it, I can send you the link to it. It basically is for people trying to raise money. If you kind of flow through it, depending upon what kind of money you're trying to raise and who you're trying to raise it from, or, or, what kind of money you're trying to raise, what the purpose is, it'll tell you who actually plays in that space for, for giving you money. So it's a great little tool for people looking for, for money for different concepts. Some people do real estate, some people do movies, some people do product deals, some people do real, uh, uh, med biomedical, and, and those are the various firms. If you go through the yes, no, yes, no, and work your way through the flow chart, it'll, it'll get you the right person. So it's a great thing. It's about a year and a half old, maybe. So you never know exactly if people are still around or have morphed to other things, but it's pr still a pretty good way to look at it. Um, so crowdfunding is, is kind of the level just after friends and family. It's kind of toying with the angel investors, uh, crowdfunding itself. And then when you get to crowd investing, as I said, it kind of moves, or crowdsourcing, it moves up the ladder. Again, the Jobs Act was a very interesting thing. It was bipartisan, so I'm not afraid to show the picture, um, switch to the picture. Yeah, I'm not afraid to show the picture of Obama because there's some Republicans up there too. Sitting in the back, it was a bipartisan bill to, that, that really is going to help the world. Now, anybody, who, has kids under, who, has, who has kids under 20? Okay. Every one of your kids got a trophy for showing up at the soccer game. Okay? We can debate that, not debate it. doesn't really matter at this point. If you're, if you're under 20, maybe under 30, you, probably under 30, and maybe under 40, actually, now I think about it, you got a trophy for showing up. No problem. I have no issue with that at all. But that started, in my opinion, the thinking that one can do something on their own. And did I jump ahead too far? I gotta check this button again. All right. That started the thinking of I can do it on my own. So now these people are becoming 30, 40, 50. And actually it's it's under baby boomer, so it's generation X. It really is under 50 now. I can't believe we're all getting older, too old. Um, those people don't use Goldman Sachs. When they inherit a bunch of money uh, at any level, they like Schwab. They like E-Trade. They like doing it themselves because they don't need their dad's stockbroker, their dad's consultant. Now, I'm not talking about the big family office type money, but you'd be shocked how many people there are that have 100,000 to 5 million that do it themselves. They will look at the internet, they will, do, they will know more than the researcher knows in an investment banking firm about that area and that space faster than, they, than, the, than the guy at the investment banking house or the third party marketer. They will research it to death and can teach on it. And I think, and up until 2013, September, they didn't have a vehicle for using that knowledge. They didn't have access to investments and opportunities. There's a reason that people, that the trend, and again, this is hard to read in the back of the room, but basically what this is showing is digital marketing has gone through the roof. It started in 2010 at 17%. It was estimated to be 30% of ad spending in 2016. We're in 2015, this slide was done in 2012. We've already gotten to 30% in 2014-15. It has exponentially taken off for digital marketing. And why did it take off for digital marketing? Here's a really simple reason. I can target you and you and you individually. I can pick what goes on your computer screen almost at will as a marketer. And that's the whole beauty of why, what I think 720 and other firms like us are gonna be able to do for people like you guys. Um, and you're gonna do, be able to do for yourself, actually. Um, I can send, I can go to, whether it's video or display, I'll call that content marketing. Whether it's advertising through Google vi uh, display ads or other products like that, or video ads um, that show up on websites, uh, we can say, and I'll give you the example. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll use a, a, an Encore example. Encore buys a shopping center. They buy it in, pick a city. 
Dallas. Pick another city. <laughs> we'll pick Dallas. That's fine. Pick it in Dallas. So they buy it. Let's say they buy the, the Tom Thumb at Preston, the shopping center with Tom Thumb at Preston Forest. Okay. Now, in the old days, they would go out to all their friends and everybody they've done business with before, and they'd say, okay, invest in our shopping center, and they would get their money. But if they go out with 10 of them, people are going to say, I'm out of money. Don't come back to me. I've got to find new investors. Now, you've got a doctor who lives at Preston and North Haven, and he shops Preston Forest every day when he's not in the operating room. And he would love to own real estate, but nobody's ever going to show him that deal at Preston and Forest. So he, but he'd like to be on that, on that list to get an opportunity. So now he gets an email and maybe he reads it and he says, well, okay, that's interesting. It's at Pre I see the picture of Preston Forest. Yeah, I may want to look at it. But then he goes to the Wall Street Journal and he pulls up a, or Fox, and pulls foxnews.com or cnn.com pulls up a video article about the airplane that crashed in the ocean. And before he sees that report, a little 15 second ad pops up. And it says, um, it's not skippable because it's under 30 seconds. And it says, hey, if you've ever thought of investment, op alternative investment opportunities, or hey, if you're nervous about the stock market going up 400 points on Tuesday and down 300 points yesterday, uh, look at some interesting alternative investments and including the Preston Forest Shopping Center that's right by where you live or around your corner. And you're thinking, wow, that's weird. I just read an email and now I'm getting a video ad that pops up. And then you Google you know, something about something and up pops a little banner ad that says, hey, if you're interested in Shopping Center at Preston and Forest, if you shop there on a regular basis, how would you like to own it? And now you're thinking, well, this must be legit. These guys are spending money everywhere. Maybe they really are a legitimate company. Now, let me go look at it. And they start to dig in. And then they call up and say, well, I'm kind of interested. They meet with Encore and boom. They've just opened up potentially every person that lives in 75230 to investing in a shopping center in 75230. Never been done before. Wasn't legal before. Now it's target marketing a specific investment opportunity. And by the way, when I'm out there pushing these ads, I'm telling my service, I want it to go to people that make more than a half million dollars, that are worth more than a, mi than a million and a half dollars, that look at business sites. By the way, I say this all the time. I tell them, I want to look at business sites and I want them to look at, uh, at sports sites. And, they, and, the, and the people turn around and tell me, you don't have to tell me, we know what they're looking at. I mean, we, we can tell you if, if it's a certain amount of money they're making, whatever, we can tell you more about that person in that zip code than you'll ever tell us. But I tell them what I want to look at. The computers now, and the cookies that are on all of our computers, as scary as it may be, because there's certainly a double edge to the sword, it is, um, if, if I run, tell them I want those ads to hit a computer, if my kids are looking at the same site and looking at the same video that I'm looking at, I'm sorry, yeah, same report, video report that I'm looking at on CNN, we will be served up completely different ads, same comp different computers, same house, same IP address, different ads because of what the computer knows about what you look at. And it's uh, my partner now with, it's even more beyond that. In the last couple of months, we've now got a new service we have. Uh, my, one of my partners uh, was buying a, suburb, a used Suburban for his wife. So he went on the internet and started trolling through websites, AutoNation and other sites to look for a, a, a Suburban, a 2010 or older or newer Suburban. Facebook, he goes on Facebook and an ad pops up on Facebook for Suburbans. Now, you would think Facebook and the internet, normal Google, don't talk to each other. Wrong. Everybody talks to everybody now. So it's a completely different world in terms of this. And what our company is trying to do, and I'll do a little self-commercial, is trying to understand, take, take the investment world, put it to, classify it as, as what it is, we're looking for investors, and send out in a, a measured way emails, display ads, video ads, to a targeted group of people in a targeted area to get them to look at the deal. Now, I'm not a broker dealer. I'm not a, a registered advisor. I'm not an investment banker. My job is marketing. I'm the outsourced marketing help. But it is a brand new world and it is, it is going to be very exciting where it ultimately ends up. 
Um, you know, there's, I could bore you with, all, with technique. Uh, there are lots of trees. If someone opens an email, you go this way. If someone doesn't open an email, you try to encourage them with different headers and subject lines and go a different way. So there's lots of trees that kind of, branches that fall off of a particular tree and lots of strategy for how you put it together. But the combination of doing uh, the video ads, and they're, and they're very simple. We have spent a fortune on ads. We've spent a little bit on ads. It almost doesn't matter in the end. It's just the message and getting it in a clear, concise, simple way out there. So we've kind of simplified everything and not done elaborate. If I have a shopping center or a consumer-facing company that I'm working with, restaurants are great. If, uh, if they make salads and they're going to, let's say it's a, a pickup company, Snappy Salad in Dallas, and they want to go open up Houston or Phoenix, and they know where the zip codes are, they're going to do their... Their, uh, their stores, their, their restaurants. Then I go hit that, air, that geography looking for investors. Well, I'm doing two things for consumer facing companies. First of all, I'm looking for investors. I'm showing a little video with a little feed of somebody making a salad, really pretty video that they probably already have in their, in their marketing library. And then I hit that area and say, hey, if you're interested in a concept that's really hot in Dallas, check this out, it's coming to Phoenix. I may not get any investors, or I may get 10 people um, to come look at it, but I've just seeded hundreds of thousands of customers that are going to go shop at Snappy Style when it opens. So it's dual purpose advertising, looking for investors and advertising the shopping center or advertising the restaurant all the way down the line. If you're going to take, I, I think that we're a great peel off, the advertising people will hate when I say this, but peel a little bit out of the advertising budget and throw it toward looking for an investor in the right way, and you will find that it will draw a lot more than investors. Last thing I'll say on this, and I'll open up for questions so I'm getting long. Um, it's a huge funnel. It's a very small amount of people that react to it. It takes time to build that reaction. It is traditional advertising. They say it takes seven or eight times for someone to react to an ad once they see the first one. They look at it several times. Um, so it is a pay game of patience. But we, did a, uh, we had a client that's a real estate client in California that, was building, bu that is building a hotel in Santa Barbara. And they're doing it on a piece of property. That they're actually the construction loan, senior secured construction loan, first lien holder loan on a, this flagged hotel that's basically within two, three miles of the beach, almost on the campus of UC Santa Barbara, next to the airport. I mean, you couldn't find a better piece of real estate. We, we did a zip code uh, lookup from San Diego to San Francisco to Santa, you know, further north, actually, within five miles of the coast, all the way up. And we hit doctors, lawyers, accountants, and tried to find investors from that swath. We didn't go further inland. We kept it really close to the coast because we figured those people would understand beachfront property, whether... It, the hotel makes or doesn't make, they'll love to have that piece of property back as an investment. It's fairly secure. So um, we, we sent out, I think we sent out 50,000 emails in the first email push, and they got 700 people that clicked and lots of people that looked at it and, and I think invested, ultimately invested in the deal. So it's, it's a, that, that's a pretty aggressive, fast-paced deal. But I think if we continue to push the targeting of the marketing, we can get those kind of results on, on everything. So um, three-prong approach, and then that's back to what we do. Again, we, we attack any constituency that one wants to go to. Uh, we're known for our going after the public, high net worth individuals, registered invest their advisors, which are registered investment advisors, um, broker dealers, we, family offices, trust companies. Uh, we've got amazing lists that we have started to really purify and make sure they're pristine. Hard, hard thing to do. <clears throat> but we've got, we, we did a, uh, we sent 255,000, I keep looking at Kellen and Rachel, my assistants are back here. Um, 255,000 emails to, to doctors. Uh, we got that list and we sent that out last week. And very few, I mean, I think 100 spam reports out of 255,000 emails, maybe a little bit more, a couple hundred, um, opting out maybe 1,000 people, 1,200 people out of 255,000. 
I mean, that's good results from a list. And just I'll finish this off with the note about my father because I love talking about my dad who's no longer with us. But he, uh, he was a pediatric surgeon in Houston. And I wrote that in the beginning of my letter to the doctors was I want to introduce you to a new thing. But let me start by telling you that I, um, my, one of my fondest memories of growing up was my father, going to my father to make rounds and watch him operate in the hospital and really going to the doctor's lounge in between cases and having them all one up each other on their stockbroker's tips of the day, which seemed to be the most that they talked about. And um, I got... 20 people that emailed me back and said, we knew your father, we trained with your father, we did this, which was very heartwarming. It was, it was kind of wild. I didn't think that list, it proved me the list actually is real doctors and, and really works. So uh, if there's a constituency out there you think you want to hit, we can always find lists for it. We are, uh, we know, we may not know everything, but we know where to go to find everything. And I think that's the most important thing. And that's what we do for a living. So, How yes, ma'am. Great question. Okay, so the website was built uh, with five components to it. It was built for investors. So we, we have a, uh, we do videos every day. We don't charge investors anything because I think that's the wrong model. There are models out there where investors pay to then see deals. I think that's the wrong way to go. Um, I think investors should want to go to the site. No one wakes up every day and says, I want to make an investment in a risky property or a risky uh, investment. So having a website like a Kickstarter to me was a non-starter. I had to have something that brings people in every day. Uh, lessons learned from retail. I had a re restoration hardware almost went bankrupt because they went from being a cool little sharper imagey kind of gifts and gadgets for the home to full furniture. And when you buy a couch, you don't go back for a couch next year. Okay? You have your couch. So they had to bring the pendulum back and sell sheets and towels and things that do bring people in on a, a more regular basis. Um, same thing with our website. We have five components to the website. Um, we do videos uh, every day. We source five to ten videos a day that are really cool, interesting videos that investors would like to see. Maybe about uh, Warren Buffett, maybe a professor at Harvard that's talking about something that's, um, you know, per that pertains to an investment philosophy or theory. We do the same thing for blogs, two to three articles. People don't read as much as they watch, so we do more video, lean more video than we do uh, articles. We have two directories that are very unique. We have a directory of every hedge fund with assets under $200 million, which is the, play, the space that high net worth individuals can play. Over 200, they're pretty much going to institutions for money at that point. But from zero to 200 million, the hedge funds are trying to get to that point so they can go to institutions. So we find it, uh, having that directory is bringing a lot of people to the site looking for hedge fund opportunities. And then we do the same thing. Those companies I talked about, the 506C program, which is a general solicitation program, we post every company that's looking for money through that program for free on the site. So if people are looking for a deal, they can come look at that. The fifth component is what we call the showcases, Showcase Village, and that is where we make our money. Companies pay us to be on our site and pay us to do the outbound marketing for them associated with it, driving people back to the site. The site has showcases. The showcases is basically everything I would want to see as an investor and everything I would want to show an investor as a, a company raising money or trying to raise money. It, some things on the site are public, some things on the site are private on the showcase. If it's private, if it's public, anybody can see it. If it's private, you click a button to see it, it will pop up and say you need to register and you need permission to, to have access to this document. Immediately sends an email to the contact at the company for them to evaluate the person or call the person and then grant them access to the private document. So it's digital data room So is part of the component of it. And, uh, it, it seems to really be working. That we make our money from the companies off trying to raise money.